Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, as we have people from all over East West Coast in the US and Israel. Uh, my name is Sigal Yaniv Feller. I'm Deputy Director at JFN Israel. I'm also um, heading the Green Funders Forum together with Marla Stein and Sherry Fox, and I'll hand it over to Marla in just a second. I'm very happy to see many, many familiar faces and also as happy to see faces that I don't know um, and people and young people and children that have joined this session as well. So we're thrilled to have you all with us. I heard at one of the Zooms in the past year, one of the endless amount of Zooms that I've been on, that someone said that this isn't a, a room of strangers, it's just friends we haven't met yet. And I like that a lot. And I think this group specifically or especially has the potential of being a good, you know, we're all looking sideways and up and down on our screen and we're, we're friends we haven't met and some of us of course have and already are friends. So just to open today, um, welcome you. This is um, a session um, that the Green Funders Forum, which is a peer interest group of JFN, um, a room of, of funders that are coming together to learn about the environment in Israel, to collaborate, to become more strategic about their grant making in Israel in the field of environment and really to be able to be a resource, a support system and a network for funders who care about the environment and specifically the environment in Israel. Um, and we've, we're hosting a session in this broader conference which is called the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest um, that this session is just one of hundreds of taking place over the next five days, I think. And we encourage all of you to take advantage of many, many, many other sessions in different times and different topics and explore their website and join other sessions as well, as well, because this is really a, a unique opportunity. And of course, the excuse of Tu Bishvat coming up and, uh, and being able to connect all of these things to Jewish values. Um, so today we're very happy to host some of Israel's most inspiring young leaders who act both globally and locally, as we'll hear very soon. The session will include um, hearing from different activists, um, from different demographs of Israel on different topics, um, with the emphasis being really the youth um, that are very active and really taking the leadership role um, and doing something about the, the issues that they care about. And I think the, the messages that they have to convey to us are very, very important for us to listen carefully, both to what they're saying to us, because a lot of the blame is on us, and also to what we can and, and should be doing about it for the sake of their life and the, their future generations and our children and grandchildren. So I think really the, the essence of this session uh -huh. is to listen carefully and then figure out what, what we can and should be doing about it. Um, the session is held by a group of funders today, but this room contains not only funders and professionals who work with funders, but also some activists and nonprofit representatives. So just for the sake of saying it, I wanna make sure we're all clear, this is a safe space. We wanna um, ask you to consider this a safe space and honor the safe space and not to use this in any way um, as a platform to solicit each other or to do any fundraising to your causes, as important as they would be. Let's keep it as a learning place for us to come together and learn and be inspired and think together. So without uh, further ado, I wanna hand it over to my friend and uh, powerhouse Marla Stein from Israel, who will um, introduce herself and uh, some of the work, amazing work she's been doing on the Green Funders Forum. So Marla, please. Thank you, Sigal. And uh, I'm zooming in from Jerusalem. I'm actually in quarantine downstairs. My family is on somewhere upstairs. Put on your video, guys. Um, so many of you know me from former programs and you know that I care about the environment. And so I've become a funder in the environment. I've become an impact investor because I care about the environment. And I'm also an activist because I care about the environment. And I do all of this because we can't afford not to care about the environment. The issues are critical and urgent and they affect all aspects of our life, whether or not it's smart cities or transportation systems that work or clean water for our future or air pollution. All of this is part of the environment and we need to take care of it now. I actually have a lot of policy interests, but none of them will be relevant if we don't do something about climate change and the environment. So when I fund in the environment, I consider it a kind of insurance policy. 
um, of sorts for everything else. So I welcome all of you, whether or not you're major funders in the environment, whether or not you consider the environment your funding insurance policy, or whether or not you're just interested in learning more. Um, so thanks to all of you. And I want at this point already to thank Sigal Yanni Feller, who is the deputy director of JFN Israel, and also Gil Yaakov, who is a veteran director of several environmental organizations here in Israel. Um, I'm doing this because not everybody can stay until the end, but you guys have been amazing partners, both thought partners, strategic partners, planning partners. So um, this has been critical in reviving the Green Funders Forum. Um, in terms of the flow of the program tonight, we have five speakers. Each speaker will speak for approximately 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to hold the questions for blocks of question and answer times. So we'll have two youth speak followed by questions and answers. Then we'll have another two youth speak, followed by questions and answers. And finally, we'll have Hila Lernow speak. Hila is a researcher at the Porter School for Environmental and Earth Sciences at the, at the Tel Aviv University. And she'll be, her actual research interest is youth activism and climate change. And so she will be our last speaker. So again, I hope you guys can all speak at the end and we'll as, stay until the end. Um, we'll have time for discussion at the end as well, but if you have to leave early, anything that you can uh, glean from this will be just great. Um, and with that, I will introduce our first speaker. Marla, so maybe Michael, you, Marla, before you introduce, just to mention to everyone, if you have questions while the speakers are speaking, you can just note them in the chat. And then when we break for Q&A, we'll make sure we go through the chat and we pose some of the questions to the speakers. So, or put them down on a note for yourselves. And when, when then when we open for Q&A, you can share them with us. Yes, thank you. Um, so Michael back, Backlund is a 12th grader from central Israel. Michael is an Israeli youth activist who is focused on climate education, solutions, and justice, and is serving as the director of the global community at Climate Science. Michael will speak about the impact of climate change on Israel and on future generations. Welcome, Michael. Um, thanks, Marla. Um, so let me just share my presentation. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So I'm going to be sort of talking about the topic of solving climate change. So as Marla just said, uh, I'm a climate activist and I started to get in activism because um, I moved from Finland to Israel and I became interested in plastic pollution because in my city where I live, there's a lot of plastic around. Now, this interest in an urge to act against plastic pollution um, prompted me to learn about climate change. And then I started to organize strikes, demonstrations, negotiations with different parties, stakeholders, and politicians in Israel. Um, and then later brought me to learn more about solutions. And currently I'm working in an organization called Climate Science to address and educate the world about these solutions. Um, but before I go into the impacts of climate change um, to our future to future generations, I'd like to indulge you guys in a pivotal moment in my own life um, that happened in fourth grade. I have been known to have a very notoriously bad handwriting. And if any of you guys are anything like me, this does not represent, the picture here does not represent what your notebooks look like. Now, by the end of the year in fourth grade, my notebook was supposed to be get graded. I'm sure I'm going to fail the class. Now, to my surprise, on the contrary, I got full points because the content was there. And my teacher wrote me a note saying that not, no minor thing, such as the look of your handwriting, is going to deny you any success in the future um, with a little heart. Now, I think this is what true leadership is about. It's about lifting people out, up rather than putting them down. And this brings me to Israel and what's happening here. We've had some fantastic revelations about technologies and what, addressing water scarcity with making desalination more affordable and scalable with all the other technologies that we have. Yet, we're not as prominent in the climate action and climate innovation area as some other countries in Europe and OECD countries are. We're not doing that well. Um, 
And I believe we can. If we succeeded in a desert to create such a prosperous country that we have now, we can turn this around. Um, so this is my vision to, for Israel. Um, we can be providing the world with our unique thinking and startup culture, more affordable, renewable energy, more efficient batteries and storage, promote and innovate um, solutions to address the world problems also in other countries in the world while working together with our neighbors in the Middle East and sharing our technologies and already existing revelations with them to promote environmental peace. Now, on top of this, while we're doing all of the other things in the outskirts of the world and helping the world, we can be making Israel a beacon of addressing our own already existing consequences of climate change are irre irre irreversible. The temperatures are going to come up and we also need to make sure that we're adapted to them. So we can be we can invest in nature-based solutions to address those challenges. Now, furthermore, um, I started my climate activism as a strike organizer, but then this led me to, and I started asking myself the question when I was organizing these strikes, how can I address the urgency of climate change and spread the word as fast as I can? Uh, and as widely as possible. Um, and now recently I've started to ask the question, how to solve climate change? And I, I can really say, when you start learning about this, even a high school student can understand it. It's not as impossible as some politicians might make, might um, make it look like it is. So first to understand how to solve climate change, I'd like to address some of the threats um, that climate change poses to us if we continue business as usual and do nothing else. Um, the blue ones are things that I can see happening in the Middle East and Israel, and the black ones are things that I can see happening on a larger scale in other places of the world. Um, now, it's also important to note that all of these threats are direct consequences, the direct results of consequences of climate change. Um, and for and those consequences might be increasing temp increasing temperatures, um, increasing um, threats of food security, water security, increased water scarcity, extreme weather, extreme temperatures, and so on. Um, and all of these things derive from those consequences. Now, the one that worried me the most is political radicalization and immeasur immeasurable economic loss that it's going to also contribute to immigration, massive inequalities, and so on. Now, also, it's important to note that people usually forget the loss of biodiversity, um, especially because biodiversity is currently valued um, in economic value to humans in $31 trillion, which is more than all of the countries' GDP, all of the countries of world's GDP combined. Um, now, when we're talking and thinking about the threats, this is what's going to happen if we're not going to address climate change. But it's also important to note that combined and united action is also going to present us with opportunities. A lot of people tend to focus only on these threats, so opportunities are sometimes sort of lost in the way. Instead of focusing on that future, we could have this future, where we could unite to fight the bigger problem um, and leave our insignificant um, differences with different countries and neighbor countries, um, and we can create a platform through climate action for peace building, for green peace building, while joining the green, green economic revolution that is already happening and only increasing because of COVID-19, while creating a equal and more fair world with making sure the gender equality principles and human rights principles are going to be standardized in all of the countries of the world. Um, I think every generation has the responsibility to make sure that the next generation leaves better off than um, their, uh, their the generation before them. Now, unfortunately, we're in a situation where if we don't do anything with our challenges, um, we're not going to be able to do that. But I think there is an argument to be made that not only that we can address these challenges that we have today, but also gain something from it. In other words, we don't need to look at things in a such a black and white way. We can be addressing the threats and taking care 
that those will not happen while exploiting the opportunities of today. Basically, what I'm saying is that humans are so smart that we can do more than one thing. We can do that. We can definitely do two things at once. Um, now, some other facts: seventy-three percent of the world, world's greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy industry. And here are some high impact solutions. Um, these presentations, I'm told, that are going to be sent to you after this. So I'm not going to waste too much time on detailing every single one, but you can look at these later. Um, and I'd like to go back to my own um, activism. And while I'm continuing raise, to raise awareness about climate change, um, I wanted to balance that out, to talk also about the solutions. It's important to uphold um, and be determined that we need to act now while we can also focus on the solutions. So that's what I'm doing in climate science and with the organization that I'm representing here today. Um, and climate science is a organization. Um, I apologize for my dog, by the way, but um, the climate science is an organization that focuses on creating um, reliable material on climate change. Basically, we saw a problem that most of the material out there about climate change and solutions are in the reliable ones are in research papers. And people are not really reading that because let's face it, it's a little boring for everyday ordinary people. Um, it's also very difficult and really hard to find. Um, so that's why a lot of people are resulting in news and blogs that are definitely more unreliable than, and sometimes even purposefully misleading. Um, so climate science set out to do a task that was really not done well, which is combining the reliable information, communicating it effectively, accessibly, and understandably to the general public. So currently we've created material, um, about 11 courses, um, that have definitely millions of words and more than 6,000 references across them. And we've succeeded. We set out to do this only to university and high school students and adults, but actually we, we found out that we've done such a good job that we succeeded to, by only having a 12, um, 12 year old read our content, he could understand how a lithium ion battery works. Um, so he, this is what climate science is all about. And we've been now operating for about a year. Um, so, Currently, um, we're also launching a um, worldwide competition, which is the Climate Science Olympiad. We were thinking, well, there's Mathematical Olympics. Why, there not, why is there not a Climate Change Olympics? So we're creating an, um, sort of a Climate Change Olympics with people who are 14 to 25 years old. There's going to be 10,000 participants and a $10,000 prize pool, and the winners will be sent out to the UN Climate Summit, which is going to happen in Glasgow this year. Um, and with this, we're going to mobilize ten, literally 10,000 people to learn about the solutions. And we're going to, we're hoping to scale this up also in the upcoming years. Now, in terms of what I do is I'm currently working internationally and also going to build the presence up in the Middle East. Um, I'm currently managing about 20 teams, but we're expecting that to come up, be around um, 100 teams by the end of this year, and we currently have 400 volunteers in the organization, um, and I'm managing 300 of them. Um, so in summary, we can, climate change is very urgent and important to act. Um, and as I said, I think we can do two things at once. We can take care of the threats, address the threats, make sure that they don't happen while exploiting the opportunities um, we can raise urgent, the message of urgency of climate, climate action, climate change, while focusing on um, creating more affordable solutions. Um, and I hope all of you guys take something from this to your own lives and your own activism. Um, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, Michael doesn't remember that. I, I may not remember. I met him maybe a year or so ago at a, a fancy um, conference and I was impressed that he was so young. I think he was in 11th grade at the time and he told me he's definitively not taking driving lessons so that he wouldn't be ever drive a private car. So he's uh, not only leading 300 plus 
people as the director. You know, he's only in 12th grade, but he's also a personal role model in his everyday life as well. So um, really, uh, our next speaker is Luna. Luna Abu Yunus is a climate activist, peace builder, and science enthusiast from the Arab city of Sakhnin in northern Israel. Luna is one of the leaders of the students' climate strikes in Israel. And all of this, and she's only 14 years old. Luna will speak about cross-sectoral youth activism as part of the youth strike for, for future climate Israel. Welcome, Luna. Hello, thank you. Just let me share my screen. Uh, please tell me if you can see it. Can you? Yes. Uh, hello, as Marla said, uh, my name is Luna and I'm 14 years old. Uh, I'm a climate activist in Strike for Future movement, um, a movement that was established about two years ago uh, from the, inter uh, the international movement Fridays for Future that was also established about two, two and a half years ago. Actually, I uh, started to be an activist from the passion of, passion of uh, to really make a change. Um, I really wanted to know more about climate change and the, the consequences behind it, as also it's also not uh, taught in schools or uh, like or any or any other uh, resource that I I I didn't really find. Uh, so I I just uh, I decided to to go to the movement and uh, and you know to be an activist and start making uh, uh, protests, strikes, and activities. Uh, this is a photo from my first strike in Habima Square in Tel Aviv. Uh, this is a strike um, was uh, in the first of September two thousand and nineteen. Uh, this day was the first day uh, of school. And uh, all of these young people didn't really go to school. Either they uh, went to this protest to, pro to protest, uh, like for the government, and to show them and to tell them, don't uh, stop denying on climate change. We need, we want really a better future for all of us. Um, actually, after this, uh, after this day of school, we went also to the Minister of Education. And we uh, demand, demand, uh, demanded him to uh, put a, a really uh, curriculum about climate science in schools. Um, actually, this, this was my first uh, strike, but uh, this was the first protest uh, of Strike for Future Israel. It was of, uh, in the 15th of um, March 2019. And I really remember uh, when I was uh, seeing on social media uh, people and my friend also was organizing uh, this protest because um, be because they really knew that this is very important to uh, to make protests and really uh, make something about the future. Um, actually, this uh, this protest uh, also was really a change uh, for Israel because uh, lots of uh, activists and lots of young people um, started to be aware and, uh, and know more about uh, the climate consequences, including me. Um, I wanna talk about uh, Strike for Future. We, we have lots of on-field activities. Uh, for example, this, uh, this uh, performance, uh, we we do this act, these activities to show the consequences behind climate change. Um, for example, this uh, performance is showing uh, the consequences of uh, extreme heat waves uh, of climate change. We do these uh, performances to uh, to raise awareness about uh, the climate change and the consequences behind it uh, to the society. Um, and we also, of course, use social media to really share lots of uh, uh, lots of content to uh, to raise awareness about the climate change. Um, actually, in uh, Strike for Future uh, Israel, we we have uh, lots of working groups. 
uh, these working groups and all the activity and uh, the activists are uh, are volunteering and uh, working hard for uh, for really uh, doing doing a change and um, you know sending our uh, our voice to the government. Um, this is also like uh, this is a photo from, for example, a working group of uh, digital affairs, and we really work hard. Uh, we are about 900 uh, uh, activists in this uh, in the movement, and we really work hard for uh, for raising raising the awareness to the to the community and also. Uh, demanding our government uh, for a better uh, for a better future. For example, uh, we also have um, on field uh, on field activities. For example, this is a Dian uh, a Dian activity, um, and in this activity, we also uh, show the effects of climate change and the consequences behind it to the people, because unfortunately, lots of uh, people. Uh, die uh, from climate change. Um, as I said, in the working groups, we work uh, on demanding the government uh, lots of uh, lots of demands. But I want to show uh, most of them. Uh, for example, we we have the first demand and the most important, uh, uh, I think, in. in we have we demand the government 50% of renewable energy until 2030, and 100% of renewable energy until uh, 2050. Uh, I want to also emphasize that uh, this number. I want to also emphasize that this number is uh, is based on the on the country because, for example, uh, Israel is considered as, as a small country. Uh, Compared to uh, to another countries, and also based on the population, based on um, if it's a developing country or a developed country, uh, there are lots of uh, lots of parameters to take into consideration. Um, and we really like to make lots of performances uh, on field to and uh, also uh, uh, to, we go to the Knesset. Uh, like to to go to the politicians to demand them to really uh, achieve these uh, these demands. When uh, another demand is also to um, to have a climate uh, climate curriculum in schools, uh, as I said, also in the first uh, first day of school uh, in the first of September strike, we went also to the Minister of Education and. Uh, demanded demanded him to uh, put a curriculum um, uh, in schools uh, about climate science because we think that it's very important that our young people and kids know more about climate uh, climate science and climate education and also from my experience I didn't really know uh, lots of lots about uh, climate uh, climate science. But after I just joined the movement, uh, I started to learn more, uh, to, to get educated uh, more. And um, we think if we want really to make a change, we need also to be educated about, about the things that are happening uh, in our environment and our climate. Uh, also, this is uh, some art. These are some articles that uh, we had recently uh, about uh, our our strikes, and we also uh, on the working groups we have um, a governmental affairs uh, working group. That in this working group we work on uh, talking with politicians and Knesset members. Right. Uh, 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 because we we really think that it's important because they need to really achieve our demands, and because these demands we think that are in, are helpful and beneficial uh, for Israel, um, and because of that we went also to meetings uh, with 
Knesset members uh, recently. Uh, this is also a photo uh, from, uh, we went to uh, the House of uh, Minister of Energy and uh, we demanded him to uh, stop the, uh, the fossil fuels projects that, that they had recently and uh, to just turn to a renewable energy. Um, and here, uh, also, if you are interested in getting in touch uh, with uh, with the protests and uh, with with the Shark for Future movement, Luna, yeah. thank you so much, and I I love the way that you're so persistent and eager to learn more. And uh, just to remind everybody, we've had total instability here with our government for the last two years, uh, but it doesn't mean to say that there's not anybody still to lobby. So um, it's great to see that you're still out there um, making sure that the government does hear our voice even if the top government is in disarray but we still need to we, st we can't let up and with that i'm going to turn it over to sigal to uh, run we're now going to have our first block of questions so please write your questions in the chat and sigal will uh, run that part great so thank you both michael and luna we're going to take a few questions now and then um, move on to the second to the second round of speakers. So um, please, first of all, if you have questions and haven't posted them yet on the chat, feel free to do that. And I'll start reading out some questions that already uh, appear here. Um, so one question, um, both to Luna and to Michael, how did you learn about activism and influencing? And how do you see your future if climate change happens in Israel and in the world? So maybe um, Luna first and then Michael, if you both want to respond. Yeah, sure. Actually, I, uh, I, I learned about climate change uh, and climate activism because I saw uh, Greta Thunberg. Uh, she, she was one of my models, uh, a Swedish uh, climate activist. And she, was, she also established uh, the movement Fridays for Future. Um, and also, like I learned about it through social media, and I started to get interested uh, about uh, the protests that are happening in Israel. Because of that, also, I uh, joined the movement. Um, and I really see um, a good future for all, uh, for all, all the activists in, in Israel. And I really like see a good future for activism in Israel. Um, I'm working also in the movement of involving uh, Haridi and, uh, and Arabs uh, to the movement as they consider as a minorities in Israel. And um, I see lots of people and like joining and uh, interested to learn more to, to really get involved and make a, a change. And um, I I'm very hopeful, uh, hopeful about it. Um, but on the other hand, we don't really or we don't really need all uh, all the world to be an activist to just uh, make a change. Um, I I saw once and I read in a, in an in an article that we don't we need like uh, approximately uh, three and a half uh, percent of activists uh, in the world to just um, really make a, a better and a uh, big change uh, for the environment. So hopefully we can uh, reach this number. Great, thank you. Michael, do you also want to respond to this? Um, sure. So as many probably here, I uh, here feel a uh, moral, moral obligation to act um, against climate change. So did I. I started uh, my activism because I couldn't imagine a world where I would live and then someone would ask me why didn't you act and I would not have a response to that. Um, to put it very shortly, um, I felt like I don't have really a decision, uh, an other option to act and I'm happy that I did make that decision because volunteering and the community I've gained through people who really care good people um, is something that is 100% priceless to me and I really cherish and value it every moment in my day and life right now. 
Great, thanks, Michael. We have a couple of more questions. So question to Luna. Did the Ministry of Education start a program about climate science? And what is the level of environmental awareness amongst your friends at school? Okay, um, so um, we are working on that. Like uh, uh, I worked also with, uh, with some uh, educational uh, organizations uh, in Israel and international, uh, internationally. Uh, and we are working, we hopefully uh, start like uh, uh, the curriculum uh, of climate science in Israel, but there is like, there's nothing now is taught in schools because also I think because of COVID uh, restrictions and all, 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 the, um, all, all, all the things that are happening in schools, I think it, they unfortunately delayed it. Um, also, uh, I think Michael and climate science uh, really uh, are, ha are like are working on um, entering uh, climate uh, education in schools. But now, like me, me personally, I don't really uh, learn climate science at school. Um, and what is the level of environmental awareness amongst my friends? Um, like they barely know something about climate change. Uh, I, I like last year when we didn't really have uh, COVID restrictions, I uh, made a presentation about climate change and um, I uh, taught my school about it. Uh, this was like uh, their first time to, to know more about uh, the climate change. Like I, I really remember the only thing that we learned about climate change was, uh, for example, um, green, uh, greenhouse gases and the effects. They, we didn't really learn more uh, about it. Um, I think because now uh, like I started to share more about climate change on social media and um, like to show them that I'm activist, uh, this, like uh, their awareness is raising. But unfortunately, it's not like barely knowing something about it. And because of that, we are also like have a working group uh, of educate, uh, climate education uh, in the movement that we go to schools, like to our schools, to the neighboring uh, schools and um, make some uh, lessons to, uh, to like kids in um, elementary and uh, and middle school to, to show them more about climate change and uh, educate them about it. Okay, great. So we have one final question before we're moving to the second round of speakers. Um, and that's what policies, and this is to both of you, both Michael and Luna, if you have an answer, what policies has the government responded to so far from the work that you've been doing? The thing that, uh, for example, uh, we had a meeting with Niki Haimovic, a uh, Knesset member. Uh, she is also a member, like uh, the head of the committee of uh, environmental, uh, inv environmental affairs uh, in the Knesset. And um, she is really helping us um, on, uh, um, on really ma making projects and uh, really helping us on uh, in, uh, like entering the climate uh, uh, climate uh, subject and in the Knesset. Um, we are also, we had also uh, uh, had contacts with uh, more Knesset members in this committee that are working also on, uh, on the environmental affairs. And um, the, like lots of things they helped us in, for example, um, uh, like uh, entering uh, more schools in that they that they are in contact with, um, for example, um, really m making more projects about uh, about um, uh, about climate change in schools and communities. Uh, I saw recently that uh, uh, the Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, is also uh, declared that that he wants to. Um, and for example, like to work more about uh, the climate change as one of the part of uh, the Paris Agreement. And we really hope that uh, 
that uh, as promised that they work uh, and act on climate change. Yeah, we hope so too. Michael, do you have anything to add before we move on to the next speakers? Um, I think the important takeaway from this is that the government is responding. There are politicians who are very willing um, to act and very cooperative. Now, is this enough? Absolutely not. It's not enough. Our standards as activists are higher and they're going to remain higher. We're not going to compromise, but that doesn't mean that we're unable to cooperate and negotiate. Um, and I, I think that's really the takeaway here. And we're going to get to those standards when we have a movement and a group, a moral army of people uh, and the next generation who's going to ke keep the government accountable. I like that, the moral army. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm handing it back to you, Marla. So inspiring. Um, wow. Okay. So our next speaker is Odelia Robbins Morgenstern. Odelia is an 11th grader at the Adam High School in Jerusalem. Odelia is a youth movement counselor in Sayarut and is a key leader in the youth campaign to preserve the Jerusalem Hills. Odelia is extremely articulate, a tireless organizer, and also a writer about the environment in various op-eds. She is also a talented singer and musician, which I happen to know firsthand. Welcome, Odelia. Hi, um, really excited to be here. Thank you, Marla, for inviting me. I will share my screen. So like Marla said, um, I'm 17 and I live in Jerusalem. I guess I've always taken living in the city for granted until about a year ago. I was hiking in West Jerusalem. There's um, the West Jerusalem Hills, which are just a bike ride away from the main city. And I was hiking with my youth movement, which is an area that I know since I've been really little. I've been going hiking there since probably first grade. Um, and somebody came to speak to us about a few hours into the hike. And she said that all the area that we've been hiking on for the past hours, including all the hills surrounding us, are going to be destroyed by building time. I was really in shock for a few uh, weeks after that. And minutes later, we took this photo of us, and um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, we're holding up signs that say, nature belongs to all of us. And this is in one of the springs in West Jerusalem. And since then, I've dedicated a lot of my time trying to make that sentence a reality. I joined a movement called Save the Jerusalem Hills. So who are we? We are about 100 citizens, mostly under the age of 30. Um, and we're working to protect the Jerusalem Hills and the nature surrounding Jerusalem. What are we working towards? So our first goal is canceling the building plan. Um, the map that you see in front of you is a map of West Jerusalem. Just for a point um, of reference, the arrow that <laughs> just came speeding past the screen is um, Hadassah Hospital. And this is where we took the picture. So all the black shapes that you can see on the map, as well as the red line, those are the building plans. And if these building plans come into fruition, uh, over 15 natural springs are going to dry up. And there will also be, it will also cause ecological and economic disasters, which I'll talk about more later. I think that that is the reason why there are people my age that are in leading positions in this movement. We know that for our survival in the city and probably even in this country, we need to preserve open spaces. And this isn't just about this small area, which isn't so small as you can see on the map, but it's about a, a bigger picture. We deserve a future. We're fighting for a future that looks like this and doesn't look like this. Our second goal is leading to the establishment of a national park in the threatened area. Sadly, we know from past experiences that fighting building plans isn't enough because if they are not protected by law, if they are not given permanent status, they will probably just be built upon um, in 10 years. We are proposing a plan that is has the resident support 
and we are going with that plan against the building project, which have had thousands, thousands of public objections. This area attracts people from all over the country, um, hikers, bikers, families, teenagers. It's nature that belongs to all of us. I think more than anything, I am fueled by understanding what is at stake. What are the detrimental effects if we let these building plans happen? So first of all, um, the area of the Jerusalem Hills um, is sort of essentially a botanical garden for animals and, and plants from all over the East Mediterranean. It serves as a passageway for these animals, which as you can see, many of which are endangered. Um, from the north of the city to uh, the north of the country to the south of the country, um, and also between different parts in the East Mediterranean. If we close the passageway, as we've been doing slowly by covering nature with asphalt over the past few decades, and this will kind of be the last blow, and we dry up their water resources and destroy their habitats, these animals and plants will have little chance of surviving and probably will go extinct from this country. And for example, the, um, the animal, uh, the TV, I'm blanking how to say it in English, um, it will probably completely go extinct because the last species is, is in the country. And a wider implication than that is climate change, which um, we've been talking about this evening, which is personally what I find most infuriating about this whole um, building plan is that the best thing we can do, one of the best, there are many best, but one of the best things we can do in a time of climate crisis is not destroy ecological systems, especially forests. It's, we can see desertification uh, happening in our country at extreme rates, and it's so angering to me that the country is choosing to put its resources on destroying our means of survival instead of preserving them. These trees are vital for our health. They absorb a lot of the pollution from the city and they serve almost like a lake in terms of um, giving, putting water back into the atmosphere. And more than these reasons, there are also things supporting building within the city instead of spreading outward. We know that the only way to put a long-term solution to the housing problem is by sustainable urban renewal. Instead of pouring money and resources into housing units, which most people in the city won't be able to afford, we should be putting our resources, the municipality should be, and our country into already existing infrastructure. So there are neighborhoods that are already struggling, uh, better neighborhoods that are already struggling to survive, if we put competition of new neighborhoods in front of them, they won't stand a chance and they will essentially become slums. And there are places to build within the city. The Society for the Protection of Nature um, has done a really extensive study showing that there are over 80,000 potential building units within the city. So people often tell me that I shouldn't object these building plans if I want to live in the city in 10, 20, 30 years, if I want to raise my family here. And I say that I'm objecting to these plans because I want, I see a future for myself in this city. Not only are these building plans not necessary, but they are also going to slow the development of the city. So what have we done over the past 10 months? We have spoken in many public platforms. Um, um, that's me and my friends speaking in one of the uh, protests we organized. We through social media, and um, as Marla said, I, I started uh, because of this um, fight writing for uh, the Jerusalem Post, which is um, an English newspaper in, uh, in the city of Jerusalem. And through um, my articles, other articles written about us, and social media, we managed to gather a really um, large community of citizens, which otherwise would have stayed ignorant to what's about to happen to our city. And we managed to bring together 
Um, we still have more <laughs> what to work on this topic, but we've managed to already start bringing together different communities within our really diverse city and country. Um, some people that are activists in our movement also are from out of the city um, to come and protest with us. This support, uh, widespread support of the residents, you could see it in the three major protests we organized in front of uh, debates that were happening in court about the first building plan, which is going to be promoted. Um, I forgot to say earlier, but these building plans are being promoted separately, uh, one right after the other. They're basically denying that there's connection between them, and that's how they plan on diminishing um, public outcry. But we know that there's more building plans after the one that is being promoted currently and that they are all connected to each other they will essentially be one big plan if they are all built so this is a picture from one of the protests um, which hundreds of people came to and because of the resident support and um, the raising of awareness that we've managed to do in the past year we succeeded in raising 400,000 shekels in 11 days in a fundraising campaign and this money will enable us to continue fighting um, the current, the most urgent plan and the uh, future plans in court, and also uh, work on creating a vision of a national park, which surprisingly costs a lot of money. Or not so surprisingly. Um, we also uh, organized tours and festivals uh, that we invited the public to in the endangered area. We created a coalition of pol po political supporters, also in the municipality and in the Knesset. Um, this picture, for example, is a few uh, activists from our movement meeting with a Knesset member. Um, and we also have the support of very big organizations. Um, I mentioned before the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel, which we work with. And we continue spreading our message in very creative ways. Um, this is, we created uh, what would happen if, if our strings would be become basically in the middle of a city. So we came and like uh, for a whole day and acted like there was a string uh, in the middle of the, uh, in downtown. And this picture has, uh, was taken from the rooftop of the municipality. Um, we managed to uh, talk to some of the people that support us in the municipality. And uh, our photographer went up to the rooftop and photographed us standing in front of a sign uh, that's 12 meters long that says, the residents demand a national park in the Jerusalem Hills. And I think that the word demand really stuck with me since then because it's made me realize that we have a right to demand. And we as citizens and as people with power, we also have a responsibility to demand. You may have gotten a glimpse in this presentation of the things that we're working against, which are so much bigger than a 17 year old in a high school, but we are making change. We have already succeeded and we continue to succeed. We are fighting for our health. We are fighting for our economy. We are fighting for our identity, and we're fighting for our future. So um, thank you for listening, and I'd love to hear your questions later. Odelia, inspiring as always, and I'm telling you, uh, your activism and your friends really keep us all going. Um, it's, I'm practically moved to tears. I mean, to think, I, when I heard from your mom that you wanted to raise $300,000, which you exceeded and raised $400,000, I said, you're crazy. That just to raise 30,000, excuse me, the shekels, just to raise 30,000 shekels will be very difficult. And look at how amazing you did. So that is fantastic. Um, okay, our next youth speaker is Yoni Netter. Uh, Yoni is currently a year, in a year of volunteer service as part of the Israeli Scouts and is one of the leaders on sustainability within the scouting movement. Yoni will share his work with youth movements leading sustainability for future generations. Welcome, Yoni. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll share my screen. Um, 
I would like to say that uh, I'm very excited and I, uh, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, as Marla said, I'm Yoni. I'm 18 years old from Haifa and currently I'm doing a youth service uh, in the Israel Scouts Movement in Jaffa. Uh, for the past two years, uh, I've been very involved uh, and one of the leaders uh, of the sustainability process that the Scouts uh, had through. Uh, and that's basically the reason uh, I'm here today. I'm going to tell a bit about the Israeli youth movement's uh, activity regarding the climate crisis, especially the scouts activity. Uh, all the youth movement and organizations uh, have uh, had similar processes, but I'm a scout, so I'm going to tell you about uh, the scouts uh, process. Um, I think that the first time that uh, I started dealing with sustainability was when I was 16, uh, we saw a movie in the scouts. We saw the movie Before the Flood uh, of uh, Leo DiCaprio. Um, and that was the first time that I realized how big the crisis was. Uh, after that, I started looking in the internet uh, and learning more. Uh, and it's, it made me understand that I have to change my lifestyle I became vegetarian, then I became vegan, I stopped buying clothes, and uh, I started educating to sustainability. So I think that the, in the scouts, climate, climate and sustainability issues uh, started in 2017. Uh, a new program uh, that called the uh, Shvatim Yerukim, it's like Green Clans, uh, was uh, promoted, and the program gave uh, every clan opportunity to send uh, two teenagers uh, to study about the subject of sustainability and bring it, bring it back to their clan. And um, every clan which participated had completed a work plan for assimilating uh, uh, this subject. And, and through the years, more and more uh, clans uh, joined the program and it made a huge impact in the scouts movement. יוני, יוני, סליחה שנייה, אני לא יודעת, אתה עוד לא עשית הצג במצגת, אני רק מעירה את תשומת ליבך. אה. היא לא בפרזנטיישן מוד. תודה. תודה. אז... תודה רבה. אז אני חושב שזה לקח רק שנה או שנה עבור כל ילד בסקאוטס להבין את המילה סטנטנטנטנט. and understand that it is one of the major issues uh, that the movement is promoting. Um, uh, no, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, small projects uh, in the clans were initiated after the program. Uh, and it also started between people who care and interested in the subject. Uh, in those years, we really see a big change in the scouts, but mainly a change in the discourse. Uh, and there's been a massive process of educating on sustainability, but not enough actions, that is behavior. So uh, the big turning point occurred in 2019 when, uh, when Luna's uh, movement like of future started uh, protesting in Israel. Um, we were... Uh, more voices in the movement, especially for the youth, uh, saying that the scouts should take bigger actions. And the first step was uh, a thinking conference uh, where, then, where more than scouts took part. Uh, and the main thing that uh, had happened uh, in uh, this conference was thinking how the scouts movement uh, and the clans can change themselves and be, become more sustainable. Um, after the first uh, conference, there were uh, a lot of other uh, conferences, regional small conferences uh, all over the country. Um, and it was a big step that uh, we, we, we saw last year. And the, the, another, another big step was uh, occurred in the middle of the last year when hundreds of scouts gathered together to a council whose purpose was uh, making the scene which would make the scouts a uh, more sustainable uh, movement. Um, uh, 
so we gathered together and the uh, decisions that uh, have been made there, you can see a picture from the, the council. Uh, a lot of uh, decisions that uh, have been made there uh, had a lot of impact uh, on the scouts movement. And for example, I managed to convince uh, the council to prohibit the uh, consumption of meat in the scouts. And this is relevant for all the uh, uh, summer camps and trips. And uh, for those who, who don't know, uh, the meat industry is one of the most pollution uh, industries in the world. So it was a, a big uh, decision. Um, another decision, was uh, opening uh, the clans warehouses to the community, aiming at uh, reduce, decreasing uh, consumption. So if someone needs a drill, he or she don't need to, to buy an, a new one. And uh, they can borrow it from the closest clan to their town, in their town. Uh, and it also was a very nice decision that uh, we made. Uh, and another step, and one of the biggest steps was uh, establishing a committee which will set up uh, the movement sustainability uh, indicators. And uh, the committee should objectives and indicators soon, uh, paralleling uh, obviously the SDGs. Uh, and it seems that the changes in the movement will be very significant. Uh, Raz Perel, the scouts chairman said that it is a goal that in a year or two sustainability be the a major topic in the scouts, and this is a very big and significant and significant statement. So, um, all these actions uh, had a lot of impact all over the movement. Uh, after that, we saw a lot of uh, local projects that youth organized. For example, my friends and I uh, saw last year that uh, the farmers in Israel lost a lot of their sellings because of the COVID and the closing of uh, hotels and restaurants uh, in Israel. Um, for those who doesn't know, uh, food waste is one of the biggest problems in the world of sustainability. So we decided to make uh, connections with farmers who needed our help and needed the help with their sellings uh, and almost through to the trash all their goods. Um, uh, so we brought uh, their vegetables and fruits to our neighborhood in good prices for the community and for them. Uh, and in average, uh, every week uh, we sold uh, 200 kilograms of uh, vegetable or fruits. Um, this project that still exists, uh, try to help uh, farmers to reduce food waste and also create a stronger community in our uh, neighborhood. So projects like that, uh, were all over the movement and there were also bigger projects that all the movement did together, like uh, the beaches cleaning that uh, in last November, where more than 5,000 scouts uh, cleaned the beaches of all Israel. Um, I told you the story of the scouts, uh, but as I said in the beginning, all the youth movements and organizations uh, have had similar processes in regards to sustainability. Uh, and now we can even see a new collaboration of all the movements and organizations uh, that uh, united together to one block called Tena. Uh, in order to change Israel's policy in this subject, you can see in the pictures all the, the movements and organizations that uh, already entered in. Uh, and in this picture, you can see uh, the, the farmers project. And the, this is a picture from the beaches cleaning. So, I think that this is true, that we, we can see an exponential change in climate change and in the global issue. However, we can also see an exponential growth in the youth involvement in climate crisis and the youth uh, movement's involvement in climate crisis. And uh, it makes me very optimistic and full of hope. And uh, thanks for listening. Yoni, thank you so much. Um, it's you're really taking the lead and uh, being an example for all of us. Uh, and just amazing that you guys have made such big policy decisions at the, at the higher level of the scouts. Uh, with that, we're already ready for the second block of questions. And I am literally moved to tears by these four youth. Um, so go ahead and write questions in the chat and Sigal, you can take over for that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Marla. And thank you very much, Odelia and Yoni. 
Um, so I already have two questions here waiting for you. One is, um, it was partially answered after it was written, but Yoni, what are the plans or hopes for joint collaboration of the youth movement? So you mentioned it a little bit. And Odelia and both of you, which NGOs, if any, have helped you along the way? Odelia, you also mentioned a little bit with the SPNI, but if there are additional collaborations with other nonprofits in Israel that you work with, uh, that's a question for everyone. So maybe Odelia and then Yoni. Um, yeah, so we work uh, alongside uh, SPNI, and we also work with um, Maseyuda, which is um, the country divided into different areas. So there's the area of Gerson and the area of Maseyuda, and um, the building plans are aiming to swallow up um, small uh, towns that currently belong to Maseyuda and kind of make them part of the city. So they're also fighting um, with us, uh, mostly in terms of funding things that are connected to court, um, because for them, there's that, that interest too, which I didn't even get to mention. Um, and there's also another movement that works with us um, that I don't know how they're called in English, but they're connected to animal rights. In Hebrew, they're called Tnu Lechayot Lichyot. And they uh, mostly talk about uh, how these building plans are going to um, be detrimental for animals. So they also are, um, in terms of court, they had a lawyer representative. Great, thank you. Yoni, do you want to also address these questions? And by the way, also Luna and Michael, if you want to um, respond to the issue of collaboration with other nonprofits, uh, you're more than welcome to join. So Yoni, and then if Michael and Luna want to respond. Uh, I think uh, that till today uh, the scouts uh, haven't been haven't been part of a collaboration with another uh, movements and organizations, uh, and I think that it is very important. I'm very very happy from the the new collaboration uh, with Tena and uh, all the youth movements and organizations uh, in Israel because I think that uh, all the small projects and even the big projects that. Uh, we have done in the scouts have a lot of impact, but together with all the youth movements in Israel, we can do bigger things. Uh, and uh, I see it as a very, very big step uh, for the future uh, of the, the scouts and the youth movements in Israel and all the subject of sustainability in Israel. Great, thanks. Michael and Luna, would you like to add anything here? Sure, um, really quickly. Um, every organization is in, is in Israel is doing amazing things. A um, couple that have helped me, Echo Peace and Mega um, and But everyone is wonderful. Yeah, I can add something that uh, actually in Start for Future Movement, we, we are not having collaborations with uh, nonprofits, but we have a nonprofit supporting us. Uh, including uh, Green Course, Mega uh, and uh, uh, Greenpeace also. Uh, so we are we are also pleasured to have uh, uh, these people helping us uh, as a students. Yeah. Great, thank you. So another question I have is how do your parents and friends react to this passion and devotion and maybe craziness if that's the way they view you. Um, so what kind of reactions are you getting and have been getting over this, uh, this time that you've been active? So maybe just let's go Odelia, Yoni, Luna, and Michael. Um, that's kind of a, a good question actually. I don't think anybody's asked me before. Um, I think my friends think I'm more crazy than my parents um, at this point. Um, even though a lot of my friends do come to protests uh, that are connected to Save the Jerusalem Hills, and also I bring some friends along to climate change protests, um, my parents are really supportive. I'm really lucky. And I think uh, my mom, for example, is with me when I write articles for the newspaper and helps me edit. Um, I'm really lucky on that point. But yeah, my friends think it's a little weird that I'm uh, for example, in two days, I have a budget exam and I'm working on this presentation instead. But <laughs> so aside from that, it's okay. 
Great, thank you. Yoni? Um, I think that my parents and friends, uh, th they really helped me with uh, these issues and my friends uh, are taking uh, an active part in the uh, process that we did in our clan and in uh, all the scouts movement. Um, my parents don't always uh, understand what I do in the scouts, uh, but they uh, they also very support uh, very very supportive in this subject. Good to hear. Great, Luna. Yeah, I I can say uh, I like when I went to the first protest. Um, my uh, parents wasn't really supportive because. Uh, I, I also came from the uh, Arab sector and we didn't really have the, this awareness about climate change. And because of that, we are working to raise uh, this awareness. Um, but when, when I became more active, um, they started to accept it and to see, yeah, you are working and uh, having events uh, and yeah, they are supporting me <laughs> as of now. <laughs> Great. And Michael? So um, I had a pretty rough time. My parents at first forbid me to do anything related to climate change, wow. uh, strictly. Um, I, I didn't really listen to them, I, I did anyways. But um, the funny thing is, uh, and, and I became also the joke of the school for uh, about a period of six months, but the funny thing is that my grandmother used to always say that um, challenges and problems are always opportunities, which is a little bit, I played with that idea in the presentation. And I found out that because I, if you keep being persistent and keep setting a personal example, people start to follow. Um, that's one of the best way of, uh, way of influencing people because you're not shoving information sort of things down people's throats. Um, so now my parents are very, um, Eco-minded. My a lot of my friends in my school. We have a small school, um, 250 students. 50 of them are currently involved in environmental activities um, and taking initiative. Um, my city that didn't really know anything about climate change started to um, replace more sustainable light bulbs in the past two years and everything. Um, so you know, personal example really works, and people are learning more when you put more information out there. So you know, tides are changing. Um, and that's a good thing. Wow, thanks, Michael. Sorry to hear it was a rough start, but uh, very inspiring words. So final question, unless anyone has any questions to add to the chat and it, it's a questions with two parts. One is, did you, and maybe it's related also to the previous question, do any of you feel that you had to pay a price for being involved in the activities you're involved? And what connections do you have with a global climate change youth movements, other than, I mean, I think Michael was the main one to mention different global branches and different countries that you're involved, but for the others maybe, are, do you have collaborations or um, connections with um, youth groups from around the world? Do you want, I mean, you have people on the call here from all over. This could be a good opportunity to make connections for you if you want as well to youth groups like you from other places. So each one of you, whatever, whoever wants to speak, just raise your hand and uh, out of the four of you. I can Delia, start go ahead. That. Ah, I Yoni, to, oh, Delia and then Yoni, okay. Okay. Um, so I think that I don't really see it as paying a price because I've gained so much also personally, also because I believe in what I'm fighting in, which is uh, a gift that I hope I will carry with me the whole life, my whole life of working for something that I believe in. Um, it makes me really happy, but I do think that it's difficult. Uh, I often find myself because um, I did say that our movement is mostly young people, but I do join a lot of Zoom meetings where I'm the youngest person by about a decade at least, and that can be a little intimidating uh, to say the least. Um, also, in terms of social life, sometimes um, it's sometimes I'm so involved in what I'm doing that it's hard to be a normal teenager. But I think that it's I don't see it as paying a price at all because I love what I'm doing and I think that it's important. 
um, in terms of connections, global connections. So our uh, site is a local one, you could say, but it also has much importance that it's um, the um, the Irbira, the, 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 the capital city, the capital city of, of Israel. So people and tourists from all over the world that are used to seeing our beautiful city, um, when they hear about this, even though they don't go there every other weekend, they still find it really important because it's going to change the way our city looks like. And it's also, it's also, we hope that when a national park is declared, it will reset national priorities. So for example, in our fundraising campaign, people from all over the world donated. And we really see it as, as um, not just about the Jerusalem Hills, but about where is our country um, putting its resources and what face are we choosing to present to people that come to visit here. So um, that that is definitely, we don't have an official connection with, with globally, but we do have personal connections with people. Great, thank you, Adelia. Yoni? So, uh... I can say that I, I do feel that I pay a little price in my life. Uh, it comes even if in the clothes and uh, in the little things uh, that I really like uh, eating hamburger and I haven't uh, eaten a, a hamburger since I was uh, 16. So uh, I do feel it, but I think it is totally worth it. And uh, I really believe in uh, in this lifestyle and uh, in this activity, uh, so I'm I'm happy with it. Uh, I'm very happy with it, and um, I'm not I'm not taking part in the global uh, in the global activity. Uh, now now I'm focusing uh, on the scouts uh, process, uh, but. Uh, I, I hope that in the future uh, I would be more involved uh, in the in the global activity uh, uh, in the subject of sustainability and the, the climate crisis. Great, thanks, Yoni. And uh, eat a Beyond Burger; it's almost as good. Uh, Michael, Luna, do any of you want to respond? Um, sure. So. I have a lot of connections to global activists because they're, they're also wonderful. Um, you, you can meet people, you can connect with people who have the exact same interests, regardless if they're in Brazil or Mongolia, and that's wonderful. Um, I do really love the internet because of that, because it, it gives a whole new platform for people to meet friends. Um, so there's many people that I can really call my, uh, my friends. And if anyone wants to be connected to anyone, uh, any youth groups outside of Israel, um, I'd be ha happy to make that connection. Um, in terms of personal sacrifice, I, I guess, um, you know, I, I do feel like I I've definitely missed a substantial part of my teenagehood. Um, I meet my friends um, sometimes, but not nearly as much as I would like. Um, I'm missing a lot of experiences that I could have, but great things need and demand great sacrifices. Um, and it, it's not even a question for me if this is worth it or not. It, it is. The standard is there. Um, and you live with the consequences that you choose. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Go ahead, Luna. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I think also that uh, I don't really pay a price, but sometimes I, I need to give up on something for something else. It's just like a matter of um, putting priorities. Um, and also um, in terms of, um, of like having uh, international connections. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I'm volunteering in uh, some uh, climate justice organizations. Uh, and um, like uh, I have also uh, really uh, good connections with uh, uh, international activists uh, of, uh, of climate, and I think that like that really improves uh, the my activism. Like I see people more active than me actually, uh, 
internationally, they are more active, uh, as I see. And uh, that's really motivated me to work uh, harder uh, as a climate activist. Uh, like I see, for example, in, uh, in the United States, in Europe, there are lots of climate activists, like uh, comparing uh, to the Middle East uh, and Israel. So, and yeah, that's uh, a really good model to work harder. Thank you so much. Um, I, there's another question, Nikki, but we'll hold that for the larger discussion with your uh, approval because we need to move on to the next speaker. I just wanna tell you, the four of you, I'm so impressed and so inspired. Um, really, I'm, I'm kind of speechless and I keep having in my mind the, the quote from Margaret Mead that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I'm not sure if I'm exactly accurate with how I'm quoting it, but that's the essence of it. And I'm listening to you and I, it's never been more true. And I just feel the personal need to say thank you for what you're doing, really, for the, for the price you're paying, for your commitment, for your devotion. You guys are totally amazing. And kola kavod for what you're doing. So I want to I wanna hand it back to Marla. We're not done yet, but I just felt that I had to say that. And uh, Marla, back to you. Um, yes, thank you. Okay, so now we're moving on to our last speaker for the session. Uh, she's a little she's a little older than youth, but not terribly old. Um, Hila Lernau is a researcher on Israeli youth activism vis-a-vis -vis climate change at the Porter School of Environmental and Earth Sciences at Tel Aviv University. And Hila is also a member of Teachers for Climate, and she'll share her insights from her research with us right now. Welcome, Hila. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's a very inspiring forum to be in. Um, so my name is Hila Lernau, and I'm here with uh, two hats. Um, one of them, you can see here, it's actually a crown. Um, I'm a science teacher. And uh, five years ago, I learned in a teacher's training program about the climate crisis. And although I thought that I already know and understand everything on the subject, I realized that it was not up to date. I realized that uh, this is the major threat on the future of my children and my students. And I changed the path of my life. The teacher's training program urged me to get out of my comfort zone to teach, to learn, to get involved and act in this field. Um, the second hat is as a research student in the Porter School of Environment and Earth Science at Tel Aviv University. My thesis is about climate protests among Israeli youth. And advisors are Professor Okefet Selashefi from Tel Aviv University and Dr. Iris El Kahar from Seminar Kibbutzim. In my research, I joined six of the youth demonstrations beginning March 2019, almost two years ago, when the Israeli youth climate activism just began. I continued coming to the demonstration during six months. I asked the teenagers uh, I met to complete questionnaires, and I collected almost 200 of them. Here you can see me and one of my private uh, students uh, walking with my questionnaires in one of the parade. Maybe this is the time to say that the participants uh, in the questionnaires are aged between 12 and 19 years old. I didn't give questionnaires to older uh, participants. And the majority of them, majority of them is a high school student, 16 to 18 years old. During the demonstrations, I just approached the participants individually. I introduced myself and asked them to fill up a questionnaire. Usually they agreed very happily and it took them several minutes to fill it up. Afterwards, I also interviewed 12 of the participants in the protests, focusing on uh, questions about the youth feelings, thoughts and attitudes toward the climate crisis, toward the protests, and concerning their previous learning of the subject at school. First, 
first thing I found in my research concerns two questions in the questionnaires and in the interview. The first one is, whom did you get here to the demonstration with? And the second is, from who did you first hear about the climate change? Unfortunately, I can say that there are almost no adults in the answers of the youth, not from the family and not from school. You can see here the distribution of the answers for the different questions. But what becomes clear is that only 35% at most claim to guidance of close adult in the subject, which means we leave our youth to find out about the inconvenient truth of the climate crisis from their peer friends and the internet. I cannot think of an other issue we would treat the same way. When asked whether they learn about climate change in school, the first answer was kind of positive. 68% of the questionnaires said they did learn at school, but only 20% referred to a structured curriculum and not to an announcement or one detached lesson. From the interviewees, none of them confirmed learning about the climate change at school. They even mentioned with sadness the absence of the subject. When I, as a teacher and as a parent, think about educating our children, I think most of the time we don't leave them to find knowledge among friends or in the internet. And into my understanding, the climate change is one of the most urgent subjects that will influence their lives. Other question was about the youth's feelings toward the climate change. As you can see, 50% answered fear and others related to sadness and anger. When I wrote a short essay about these results, the editor answered me, well, what did you expect? You would have the same results if you asked them about their feelings toward violence inside the family or earthquakes, and that is true. The, su the surprising result is that parallel to the harsh feeling of anger and helplessness, there were also more than 30% of positive expressions, such as hope, pride, and willing to act. In the academic literature, Paula Furere calls it hope that rises out of despair. And Joanna Macy calls that active hope. In research about hope in desperate situations, it, will, it is well accepted that once people act, their well-being and hope start to rise. It is not surprising that when asked about their feelings toward their protests and demonstrations, the amount of hope, pride, and positive and active expressions were much higher. When I joined, joined the youth protests at the beginning of the school year on the 1st of September, 2019, and uh, you saw this with uh, Luna's uh, um, uh, um, pictures before, the youth read their demands out loud. They called upon the government to declare a climate emergency. And what impressed me the most was their explicit demand to integrate climate change syllables in all classes. Unknowingly, they had made the same demands that appeared in the paragraph 13.3 of the UN SDGs for 2030 to improve education and raise awareness toward climate change mitigation and adaptation. And now, wearing my teacher's hat for the conclusion of my thoughts. In the last six months, I began to teach the climate crisis curriculum I had learned five years ago in Zoom to the youth that demonstrate, actually, I work for them. This young girl, Noam, called me last July and asked if I was willing to cooperate and teach about the climate change to her friends in the protest movement. And today, I teach the fourth session. We meet every week for four months and they hardly skip any meeting. The participants learn accurate and adequate updated knowledge about the science processes, the climate change, about the solutions, and with critical pedagogy, we also learn about the important place of the civil movement and civil power, their power. 
the discussions are fascinating. And every time a united, close and supportive group created where together they confront difficult feelings like fear, anger, and sometimes even shame. A space where there is an adult with the knowledge, the attention, and the time for the long and deep process. When I look at them, at the youth that lead the protests, I see them everywhere. In all adults' demonstrations or conferences, I see them in the Knesset. I see them in front of mayors of cities. They are doing all this voluntarily with minimum help from grown-ups. They are doing all of that instead of learning for their exams, instead of hanging with their friends. As Greta said in one of her speeches, they are not supposed to act that way. They are supposed to be youth minding their own business. We should be there with them. We should help them. Thank you. Hila, thank you so much. Um, I myself have a few questions. Um, we're going to now open it up for questions specifically to Hila before we uh, close with discussion, like a general discussion. Sigal, do you wanna start that then? I already have a question for Hila and anyone else who has uh, questions they want me to share with Hila, just put them in the chat. Um, so one question here was, um, do other teachers participate in your teaching sessions? And are your teaching sessions open to all youth or only from a specific group or school? These teaching lessons in the Zoom, uh, they are open only for the youth that are in the um, Friday for a uh, strike for Friday for uh, the, in the protests. Um, we, the teachers that um, teach this uh, curriculum, we think that the climate crisis is a crisis. It is something that is needed to study very slowly for a long period of time and to um, understand the feelings that it rises inside us. And we don't think that it is okay to come to just any student and teach them about this crisis in time of the corona crisis. We don't meet our st students face to face. We don't know if in their houses there is a um, health crisis, um, um, financial crisis, we don't know anything. So we decided we won't teach this curricu curriculum this year, but, but uh, me and another um, teacher that uh, taught Luna just uh, three, four months ago, um, we teach in the Zoom only for the children that are children, the youth that are in the Strike for Future movement. And what about the, the other teachers that take part in, in your teaching? Which other teachers? Are there other teachers? That was the beginning of the question. Are there other okay. teachers that, uh, that participate in your teaching sessions? Or, I mean, we need to duplicate you, obviously, to, to reach larger crowds, to have reliable information, and to be able to really engage. But so one more obvious solution seems to spread sideways to other teachers so we're curious about do you have that there sentence? are there are more teachers i myself uh, learned it in a teacher's training program and uh, this year i teach uh, with two friends uh, a training program for other teachers but what i can say is that this curriculum um uh, is a long one. It takes something like 30 to 40 hours of learning in schools. And it is very hard to um, convince the Minister of Education that all this time is uh, possible and is needed for the climate uh, crisis uh, subject. They mm -hmm. try to, to um, make this uh, program very much shorter um, so there are not many, many teachers in, in, in normal times, there are not many teachers that uh, teach this uh, program. No. I see. But we have very good advocates because Luna and her friends are going to mayors of uh, different cities, to um, 
uh, people in the Knesset and they are explaining that they, this is where they got all the answers that they look for. So um, for now we teach them, the, the ones that know about the climate crisis, we teach them in the Zoom and I hope that they are getting the answers they need. Great. Another question, maybe you touched it, but just tell me if you have additional points to add. Can you share a little bit more about Teachers for Climate? Yes, it's a, it's a new movement that uh, was established only one year ago. Um, we are working, um, not all the teachers in the movement teach this uh, curriculum. Not everyone had uh, passed the um, training program, um, but we want to be a place for teachers that want to teach any kind of, pro of program to, to have a, a place to, to talk, to uh, make uh, new lessons, to, it's, it's not, it's, it's very hard um, to be near this, uh, pro this subject. It, it takes, of, just as I showed that it takes from the, from the youth, uh, hard feelings, it's from everyone. And they uh, just need uh, uh, um, people to talk to people with, from your peer, <laughs> peer friends. So um, this is uh, the main um, um, things that we do. Um, so maybe that's a good uh, segue to the same question we asked the youth here. Do you feel that you're paying a price and how does your surrounding community treat you or what type of responses are you getting to this, to your involvement? Um, I feel I'm paying the price that I'm willing to pay. I, I work in a school, in schools that I know that the principal of my school will be behind me uh, about what I teach. I know not all the teachers uh, around me or the ones that have uh, had the, this uh, training program feel the same. Um, so I'm, I'm very lucky and um, I, I, I think I do have the support from my friends, from my family, that to have this time to, to work on this activism. Uh, for me to teach this for the, the youth that uh, in, the, in the demonstrations, it, this is my activism. It's like my way to, to give them the, the knowledge and the power to continue. Great. So Marla, did you also have a question to Ila or should I continue to read from the chat? Uh, well, I just have a question that was addressed to me in the chat. Um, do we know how many youth are in the climate movement like total? Is there some kind of an estimate here in, in Israel? And also then how many teachers are in climate science and is there any plan or ability to scale it up? Uh, I think Luna said how many um, uh, participants are in the Strike for Future. It was several hundreds. Yes, Luna? Yeah, uh, we, we have about 900 activists uh, in the movement. Um, but, you know, like, uh, like some activists are more active than the others. Yeah. Yes. So I can say we have a Facebook... Um, uh, page and we have 500 people in the Facebook, but we envy the Strike for Future. We are around 10 people that actually um, do and uh, work uh, about uh, this uh, movement. Um, and yes, we 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 all the time. It's it's only one year. It's a Corona year. Uh, we all the time we we work to to try to spread the, the ideas and the and the rumor. <laughs> um, it's it's a, a profession <laughs> by itself. Marla, were th were that all your questions? Um, yes. So we yes. Great. Um, so we want, maybe this is a good point to open it back again to all the speakers. Um, and that's to ask you all, maybe last starting from you, but then if the other four also have a response, 
the, this conversation started by being a conversation between the funding community, both funders and professionals who work for foundations, and you as youth activists. So from your perspective, what is the role philanthropy can play? What, what can and should, in your eyes, funders do to help make this a critical issue that everyone is noticing and that you know, good important work is done to really be able to battle climate change? And in that also, what, is, what do you see the role for civil society? So it's kind of the two angles of philanthropy. You have, you have our ears here. What, what is your message to us? So any one of you wants to speak, just raise your hand and I'll give you, I'll point it out to you. Hila, do you want us to start with you? Do you have anything to, to say about what do you think philanthropy's role and civil society's role should be? I think the only way to, um, to fight the climate crisis is is with the civil society. Um, I think the leaders all over the world um, don't listen enough. They don't act quick enough. And um, the young people that talked here today, they and we and our children will pay the, the price for um, uh, decades that uh, we didn't do enough. Um, I don't know much about philanthropy. Um, I'm a teacher. <laughs> I get my salary from, uh, from the Minister of Education. Um, I, I, I know that these kids, they, they work in their volunteer time. They, they sh as Michael said before, they should do other things. They should be teenagers. Um, I don't know, just try to help them. Yeah. Okay, any one of our younger speakers, do you have a message for the philanthropic community? Michael, I see you unmuted yourself, go ahead. Yeah, um, exactly as Hila said, um, just to more emphasize on what we're doing. I have on first day, a final exam of high school in literature. I haven't studied to it. I haven't attended lessons either because I'm, in meetings. I've attended, I think, five lessons in the whole year. Um, so I have, after this, a pretty um, exhausting marathon to get to get to literature. Um, but yeah, um, luckily, I have a couple of friends helping me out. In terms of philanthropy's role in civil society, if you look at the market, right, the market is fueled by self-interest. Um, and that on one hand, that's a good thing because startups are born because people are trying to um, you know, get ahead in the game and then they're trying to innovate, but also it does produce the things that we don't want in, from a collective perspective um, that are fueled from self-interest. For example, a person can devote their whole life to solve water scarcity in Tanzania, for example, and they would still earn substantially less than a person who would create an, an addictive social media game app for um, promoting gambling for third graders. So we need philanthropy and these kind of, this kind of collective social responsibility and also help from, we shouldn't only rely on philanthropy, we should also rely on governmental help and UN help. Uh, but as I said, we, we can do more than two, one thing at once. We can do two things at once. Uh, so we can work with philanthropy and we can work with governmental institutions to balance this out. Um, because that would basically be the only way where we can reduce inequalities and have the increased sort of economic trend. Um, so that would be my insights, but I'm still a um, high school student, so I'm not sure how accurate that is. Okay, thank you. Odelia, Luna, or Yoni? Um, I can say that we're seeing it really strongly, um, specifically in the Battle of the Jerusalem Hills, is that we raise 
400,000 cycles in 11 days from um, mostly we didn't have huge uh, donations. It was just from people. I think we had 8,000 donors. So that's a lot, a lot of people that, that uh, um, use their money for this cause. But still, we're, we keep meeting this again and again is that um, the other side is paid to do their job and they have as much money as they want. If, for example, the building plans are um, now at the um, level of just the city and then they go to the level of the country, still like they're ready for each battle and think that um, in order, we have to be ready as well. And it just comes down to um, we're volunteering and we don't have uh, money from the government. Um, so I think that in terms of, uh, like Michael said, I'm a high school student and I don't really understand economics too well, but uh, we have seen in the past year how just from that 400,000 shekels that we managed to collect, our status has changed. People started taking us seriously. Um, we're being included in um, more serious conversations with well with wealthy organizations and um, maybe in a different world that would be without the 400,000 shekels. But um, like I said, the other side has as much money as they want. So in terms of donations, just showing your support um, also publicly is really important. We're all powerful people, um, but still some people are considered more powerful by society at least. And publicly showing your support is, I think, really helpful. Thank um, you. I'd, I'd like to yeah, yeah, add to that, actually. Ah, Michael, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, sorry, because I really thought that, that was a good point. Um, so I, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I 100% agree with Delia. Um, and, um, you know, these fossil fuel companies have invested billions of dollars to lobby campaigns just to keep us out and just to keep, uh, keep us away from innovation and common logic. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why there are so many people, particularly in the US, who are against climate change because they've been misinformed. Um, so as long, you know, if there is a thousand people who are going to shout at them and they have billions of dollars to public misinformation campaigns, that's not going to change a lot. But a thousand people with extremely loud megaphones are going to be much, much louder and going to make a much bigger difference. You know, there's the tools that are going to, there is the willingness and when they get the tools and we're on the right side of history, we do have the uh, truth, we have the science. There's no doubt that nothing can stop us if we get the right resources. Completely agree with Odilia's point. I think that was a very good one. Great, Luna. Yeah, um, I wanted also to add that, for example, in the Strike for Future movement, we have like a kind of a small budget that we collect from donators uh, and people, but like when needed. But actually, uh, I agree, like also with Odelia and Michael, um, that's uh, uh, like uh, a problem we also face in the in the movement itself because. Uh, um, when we need something, we really uh, need people to donate us. And we, when we need for uh, like a, a small budget, we also <laughs> uh, like, uh, I can say that we limit, uh, limit ourselves from uh, like uh, doing something just because uh, of not having uh, money. And also, and at the end of the day, we, we still students and don't really um, get the, the money we need. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you all. I wanna be very mindful for the time and we wanna end that time. So I just wanna say before I hand it over to Marla to close, first of all, thank you all. Thank you, Ila, and thank you, the four of you, um, Luna, Odelia, Ioni, and uh, Michael for your, for what you do and for your presentations and preparation. And Michael, I hope you succeed in your literature Mivchan Bagrut, that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, this isn't the price you need to pay for your climate activism.
but I think we should all leave with thinking about what each and every one of us can do, whether we're wearing a hat of, a, of an individual, a citizen of Israel or of another, another country with how we live and what we buy or what we don't buy or what we eat, whether it's with our business involvement or through our philanthropic involvement or our household and how we raise our kids or, or how we live. And, and I think with every one of us, with changes that we do, we can make a difference. And definitely really as a philanthropic community, we can make a difference. We can continue to explore together. We know that the climate change movement and the environmental movement in general cannot get money from the corporate world mostly because of conflicts of interest. And it's really important to have philanthropy um, support these initiatives because they have such a, um, a, confl a conflict of interest. So it's very important to have a strong philanthropic backing to these initiatives and definitely this next generation of leaders is, is what we're really depending on for a better future. So I wanna thank you all and hand it over to Marla to close. Again, thank you so much for coming. And many of you who are on this actually said that you could only come for part of the time or you had to leave. And many people did have to leave, but I'm really impressed with the people that were able to stay for the whole time. And I think that's just, um, gives credit to all of our speakers, the youth and also Hila for how inspiring really you all were. And as I said at the beginning, I personally am an activist and uh, I know that the burnout rate is really high. So it is um, super important and inspiring for all of us to see you guys. Um, you know, I was in touch with Odelia a little bit during uh, the phases of her fundraising campaign and every suggestion I gave, she said, I'm on it, I've already done it, I'm meeting with them. I mean. It was really incredible um, to see how many ideas and connections were already made. So um, I really uh, very hopeful in the youth and I apologize on the behalf of all of us older generations that have left this world in such sorry shape for you guys. Um, so let's all do what we can. Um, so just to say that this whole session was actually part of a bigger festival called the big, bold Jewish climate fest, something like that. And you can go on the link for the whole festival. There's a range of options that have nothing to do with us, but I'm, so I have no interest in telling you this, but there are really a range of really wonderful offerings at this climate festival. Some of them are, are good for Israel time. Some of them are not so convenient, but you can see a range of programs and maybe even get ideas. And in terms of the funders that are on this program, we will continue to have uh, throughout the coming months, uh, uh, programs for the Green Funders Forum, which has been a great way to network and share information and uh, try to really move the funder movement forward on climate change and other environmental issues as well. So our next programming will probably be in conjunction with the Jewish Funders Network Conference, which is March 15th through 17th. And uh, we have been promised that there will be a session devoted to Israel's environment as part of that. And um, just so you know, Israel's environment, even though we're a small country, it, as uh, I think Seagal said at the, or somebody said at the very beginning, we're really a climate change hotspot. So it's not just a, a tiny thing that affects just 9 million people. We're part of a, a greater regional and world problem. Climate change very much affects Israel in terms of uh, the refugee crisis around us and how we're Affected that, not to mention the rising Mediterranean and totally rising temperatures that are going to make Israel uninhabitable in the coming decades. So uh, the burden is definitely on us. So look for programming uh, from us in the future.